Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Book Club of the Air for Young Adults. I'm Kitty Feldy, and we're, of course, here once again at the downtown L.A. Library. Our book this month is a science fiction novel. It's called Orvis, and it's been written by H.M. Hoover. And I'm joined by a trio of former students from Vista Elementary. They're moving on to middle school. With me is Chris Tremonti. Hi, Chris. Hi. Also, Maddie Christman. Hi, Maddie. Hi. And Chelsea Reza. Hi. Hi. And you guys are going where next year? Well, Valley. Maddie's, <laughs> Maddie's going to Hillside, and, I, and Chelsea and I are going to Valley View. Okay. So, so a big new adventure ahead of for all of you guys. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about Orvis. Uh, what's it about, Chris? Well, it's mainly about this girl named Toby and her friend Thaddeus, and they they meet this robot named Orvis, who is going to the dump to shut himself down and. Toby doesn't want that because she wants to feel for Orvis because Orvis is just like a robot who has no friends. She, it's just a robot. When does this take place? Way in the future, like okay. 500 years in the future. All right. so. so it's not unlikely to encounter robots in a regular basis. No, it's basis. not. So Toby decides to befriend the robot named Orvis mm -hmm. and Orva, Orvis decides to come home with her to the academy and Everyone else doesn't want the robot. They want Orvis out of there because they think it's a dangerous little military robot. And so to Toby gets this idea. She, she wants to sneak Orvis away in this little melon container to her <laughs> great grandmother's. Stinky melon container. Yes, it's very smelly. And they take, it, they take the robot to her great grandmother's and they get stuck because they get hijacked. In the, in the middle of the empty and they're stuck there for a couple days and they get some few adventures like eating frogs and they get <laughs> stuck in this weird village tons of crazy adventures and they eventually meet up with their grandmother and there's a huge surprise at the end which is really cool all right don't tell it yeah we'll I'm, save not gonna, it I'm not gonna part. save it all right I'm gonna save it Chelsea who are the characters um, the two main characters were Toby and Thaddeus and Thaddeus is very very gullible actually because he will believe a lot of things that don't really make sense. Like? Like when they were in the village and they were, the villagers were trying to make them stay and giving them different uh, possessions. He um, believed and wanted to stay there and, but um, Toby kind of talked, talked him out of it. And Toby is, um, she feels unwanted by her family, and she is determined to get Orvis to her great grandmother's house, and um, she is very brave. Maddie, who else? Um, Orvis is mostly the main character. He's an obsolete robot who Chris had already said he was going to shut himself down. He had five past owners where he. Um, found lots of facts and he became very smart and throughout the book he interacts a lot with the humans and he kind of becomes like a human because at first he was like a robot of course and then once he sees more human actions he becomes a, like a robot like a human and has more feelings and has a responsibility to care for him for the two characters he feels that and he does end up mm. having a big responsibility well, let's hear just a little bit from the book in case somebody didn't get a chance to actually read the book. We have a very special guest with us today to read a little bit from the book, the actor Robert Picardo, who I think a lot of people probably know from Star Trek Voyager, where he played not exactly a robot, but a holographic doctor. He's with us to read just a little bit from Orvis. Yay. She had never liked robots. They made her ill at ease, but this one was somehow appealing. It looked like what it was. A machine. In her experience, that sort of simple honesty was rare, in both things and people. She ran down the hill for a closer look, dodging bushes and briars, and settled on her haunches to study the thing. Up close, it looked even older, less bug-like, but still awesome. The body had been painted brown. The paint was worn and chipped. Patches of yellow, silver, and dirty orange showed through dents and scratches. Any flat space on its back was covered with ring marks, as if people had set wet cans and glasses there. 
The body was lumpy with housings, oblongs, domes, and protruding rods. There had once been hair-thin sensor wires around each foot. Only a few remained intact. Where is it going? She wondered aloud, slowly circling the machine. How did it get lost? I am not lost. <laughs> what a funny voice. Have I made rude personal remarks about you? Said the robot. Have I objected to being stared at? and examined like a thing? Have I speculated aloud on your competence to judge me? Have I asked why your eyes are red, swollen, and unattractive? <laughs> I speak as I do because I am a robot, not an amusing adult toy, a robot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other <coughs> robot engagements, you know who to call. Okay. That was very good. Thank you. Well, you sure get a taste of uh, Orvis's personality in that. <laughs> yeah, that was really weird. He has a good voice, though. That so was good. really cool. What, Orvis is, let's describe this. He, what was his original purpose? He was a military device, and after some years, he became a... Oh, he belonged to a bookseller and a ton of other owners, four others, and he outlived them. So when they died, he just moved on. But he has kind of an attitude. He's not, I mean, yeah, even though his voice not, was all one level. Mm -hmm. He's definitely different than most robots. Well, where did that come from, do you think? Probably, Probably from the past owners, seeing how they treat him or what work he has to do. And maybe he didn't like the work and he probably just thought, and he kind of developed an attitude from that, probably. They call that um, uh, sentient beings. You know, when does a creature become more than just a robot? And when does it become, you know, something with a soul? Right. Where, how do you think, I mean, did, did Orvis get to that point? Yeah, he did. Yes. He certainly did. And when? I mean, as you say, does it just through the years of him being around human beings? or No, I when? think he started becoming more human as he met Toby and Thaddeus, and he's sort of bonded with them, and he started feeling more responsibility and care for them as time went on, and they went through all these things, just going through the empty. He would just stand by the fire at night just watching them, and it was just incredible how you would imagine a robot doing that, because you don't usually see robots that care for people. They just do what they're supposed to do. Well, Maddie, do you think that's what defines him as more than a robot, is his ability to care? Yeah, because, like, I think that he did do that with um, Toby and Thaddeus because they had a different perspective on him than most other people. Most other people would always try to avoid him and would look at him with fear and think he was very dangerous, but they, they were just, they questioned that and they didn't think that because they, like, gave him a chance almost. And, they wanted him to be their friend, and that's, I think, what kind of triggered him to understand the human ways and become more like them. Did you like him as a, as a character, Chelsea? <laughs> um, yes. I mean, because it's so funny to say you like a robot as a character. Yeah, like but um, he was very, he, he was a very interesting character, too. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of crabby. Mm -hmm. And what else? Yeah. Um, Chris? He's got all these emotions, it's just... Wait, wait, robots with emotions? Hmm. Well, okay, we'll call them robot emotions. Okay. They're very <laughs> cool, though. <laughs> they uh, seem real. They're, they're different. He's just play. it seems like he's all in one tone the whole time, mm -hmm. but he's really not. He's got research and he's just thinking of how to do things, how he has his own perspective of things, so yeah. that's very different. It's, it's almost like he's a human being, but he's, he can't be because he's a robot. In so. some ways, he seems more human than right. like the people who run the school <coughs> or some of the bad guys in the yep. book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that future. Um, describe it a little bit, Chelsea. Um, very, very future-like. <laughs> there was like flying cars and robots and living on Mars and living in space and 
What had happened to the earth? How had the earth itself changed, Maddie, from today till then? Well, it's different because of course all the things that she just said and it's changed because probably um Chris most people take? on <laughs> earth they just like well thank you first of all most people on earth they just kind of went up into space yeah. because they didn't like the habitat of earth it was over polluted mm. because too many people were there mm -hmm. just overcrowded too crammed so they decided to move it out into space and they moved it further on and they were just, now they're living in space colonies. They have different laws or rules that they have to apply to. And it's very different than Is it from appealing now. to you? Is it, no? no I like to, uh, if, it, if I were to, had the choice to live out there or on Earth, I'd like to live on Earth. Why? It's just, I like the open spaces. Yeah. It's just really neat. I, I wouldn't want to be vacuum sealed in like a small <laughs> container out in space, <laughs> out in, in, in empty abyss, it just wouldn't suit me. I, I wouldn't like it. Maddie, what do you think? Yeah, I would much rather live on Earth just because of um, the way of Earth, just same reasons like not to be vacuum sealed, just the open space and the beautiful animals that are around and just the way of living on Earth instead of being so like concealed. Yeah. Chelsea? I agree with both of them. I'd rather live on Earth because, you know, the animals and all the, you know, plants and nature and trees and the air is probably much different. Mm. You know, um, Orvis itself, I mean, I was thinking about this with the, the, the Mars rover and the Cassini spacecraft that's going to Saturn, that, you know, Orvis was from our era, really. He was a very old robot. Right. And I kept wondering <clears throat> if maybe he was one of those. Mm. Probably. I mean, it, it's a definite possibility, yeah. but this is fantasy. It's not reality. But it, it could have been because he. It said the book said itself that he was out in like Venus, uh, getting mo rock samples mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. examining the planets. So he probably definitely one of, was one of those from our time. Maybe a couple of years later, like twenty years from now. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. It, you it guys know. Was. You guys have been following the space stuff. Yes. And you, yeah. went to, what, you went to JPL? We went to JPL. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like? In March, it was very cool. It we was got definitely to, different. We got to see the rovers move around in a uh, habitat that they dressed up as it would be on Mars. And we got to actually have one crawl over our backs mm -hmm. to no. see how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't it heavy? Didn't it squish you? Well, it no. wasn't the real rover. It was they small. Very it light. was a small it model. It was the base Sorry, of the rover. They didn't got it. have yeah. any equipment on it But we it just yet. lined up and it went over our backs. It was actually cool. What did it feel like? Tickly. Like any other <laughs> Just like any other race car going over you, just yeah. a lot slower. Oh, well, that happens a lot, yeah. too. Race cars going over you all well, the time. Well, not race cars, the remote controlled ones. Oh, okay. Yeah, remote control that. cars yeah, go over you know, all the time. Yeah. Have that <laughs> Probably more than you than me. Yeah, definitely. Wow, so they took you around to see how that, was it, in, I mean, it was understandable, it wasn't too hard? Oh, yeah, because we did our little yeah. research before we went on that trip. Mm -hmm. Our teachers were very tight about it, so we had to know a lot of things mm -hmm. before we went on that field trip. So how does the science in this book stack up to the science you've learned, the science you saw at Jet Propulsion Lab? Um, it's, it, it, it leads to the technology in the future, because yeah. we know so much now, but we won't be able to live on Mars yet, because our, our age now is not very high tech, they're used to all the old things, so we need to, as, as time goes on, we get older, we graduate, and we move on, so we'll be the future. We could pr probably make all those things, or our children, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter. So we could, the next era, mm -hmm. we could age on our science, so we could get better and better until we figure out how to make those little spaceships into space colonies, so that would be really neat. Is that something you'd like to do someday, Chelsea? Do you see yourself as the first woman to step foot on Mars? Not really. <laughs> really? <laughs> really. Um, My husband always does a tricky thing. He always asks somebody how old, how old they thought Neil Armstrong was <laughs> when he walked on the moon, 
and then they think how far in the future is that from you know they think okay how old will you be when you're that age and <laughs> maybe we will have the capability to send a person to Mars and then you know to make it possible in a kid's mm -hmm. mind that maybe they could be that first yeah. person to step on <laughs> you Mars never know. you never know yeah. but you're not interested in space travel for yourself necessarily no <laughs> because I don't know, I just don't see myself doing that. <laughs> How about you, Maddie? Well, at the time, I don't, like, it's not my dream to be the first woman on Mars, but once you grow up and you get a better understanding of the possibilities and all that, you, I could, it's anything's possible, so. Do you like science? Yeah. Kinda. I'm not that much. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. How about circle rides? Can you go the circle rides without throwing up? Yeah. We'll see. I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're already two steps ahead of me. How about you, Chris? I probably could do the circle thingy. Yeah. I, I'm used to science. It's just, it's not my best thing. I, I would do it for the sake of the people. Yeah. But I wouldn't do it for myself. I wouldn't be the first person on Mars. Oh, I'd you'd rather have like, somebody else be the first person? Yeah. <laughs> Why? That'd be really cool, because then I'd be a part of it. Oh, I wouldn't I be see. the whole thing. I'd have some credit to give, <laughs> give off of my shoulders. But see, that's a real, that's an interesting thing, because generally people have a lot of ego. They want to be the first person to do well, everything. Yeah. You know, not to I'm, be part I'm of a team. Really. How well. normal of you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the ego in this, all of this? I don't have an ego. You don't have I, it. I, I, I like to share. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so, thinking about that future, I mean, is that, do you think that's a possible future for us, the way we're going today? It's very possible. I mean, it's very interesting how H.M. Hoover um, draws it out for you, and she really gives you a good picture of it, and then you really think about it. And it's very possible with, like, pollution and population. Mm -hmm. The, w those are hints that can lead up to that actually happening. Well, yeah, because our Earth is really polluted already now, so we need to do something about that, or we're all going to end die. up in the habitats. Yeah. End up in habitats, <laughs> just stuck on, floating around, and our planet would just be one ball of smoke. It wouldn't be that great. <laughs> how hopeful are you that your generation will be able to figure out how to fix the pollution, Chelsea? Um. <laughs> I guess, I don't really know. I'm very <laughs> hopeful. You're hopeful, all right. Yeah. One we don't know. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm, well, I'm yeah, hopeful, yeah. <laughs> well, you're hopeful that that won't end up happening because of the things that it has to happen to do. So, I'm hopeful, yeah. Well, <laughs> people need cars and things and planes to get around the country, like for a vacation mm -hmm. or just to get around to go to work or things. Like, most people don't live a few steps away from the grocery store or from their business and they need equipment like that but it's really polluting so there's a little balance there that you need to learn how to use it's you can make it or break it it's just very complicated well they talk about you know urban planners today who are planning cities of the future they're trying to build next to like the gold line that runs out to Pasadena they're building businesses and homes that are like right along the rail line so people don't have to have a car to get to the grocery store and to the right. office. But a lot of older people think they don't want to live like that. Do you think your generation would want to live in a situation without a car? Or that you wouldn't have to use a car every day? I don't think so because the technology, like when you're just going to the grocery store, you don't think, oh wait, I'm polluting right now, maybe I should walk. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so you just like get in the car and go. So I don't think that we would really pay attention every time you go out to do that. So probably not because. Right. But still, it's, it's something you think about now and then, not every day, like when you're walking to school or just taking the car. Oh, I'm polluting. Maybe I should just stop and walk. It's just it's something. It's just the natural thing you don't to get in the car and go to the place. Yeah, because you're, you're probably in, the, in your car like half the day at least. Yeah. So it's, it's very weird. It's very complicated. I wonder what it'll take to get people to think about it every day. <laughs> National TV, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things in this book, it's um, a very interesting way that people get old or don't get old. Yeah. So speak a little bit about... They've got, they've got like aging technologies where you stay young for a long time, but it's very weird because people, it seems like they're living 130 plus. It's not what you would see normally, but you know, it's, it's different in the future and we have to accept that. So but what do you think about, you know, a lot of them had all kinds of um, cosmetic surgery so that they would yeah. still look like they were 30 <laughs> years old. What did you think about that? Or what did the characters think about that? And then tell me what you think about that. The 
characters thought it was a little sickening. Yeah, because, they didn't like it. Um, Dr. Ebert, which was uh, Toby's guardian, when they were talking, she mentioned that, and she like went into full detail, like, yeah, she had this, and it was kind of strange to her, like, she, but she looks good, but just look your age, it was strange to her, definitely. Yeah. Well, what do you think about that? Because even today, you know, we may not have all the magic surgery they have, but oh, there's so much available, Botox mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> a little bit of laser work around the eyes mm -hmm. and all that, a little bit of stuff in your lips, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, I would really want to look my age. Why? Just because it's not something I would, I wouldn't want to look 30 and then they're like, oh, how old are you? I'm 110. <laughs> that wouldn't make sense. It, it just wouldn't be right. I, I'd like to look my age, even though, it, even if I was old, it just wouldn't be something I would want to do. I'm going to come back to you in about 40 years and ask you the same question, see if you've changed your mind. Okay. But, okay. Yes. What about you, yeah. Maddie? Mm. Well, of course, everybody likes to not look their age when they're in their 40s or high 50s or whatever. But like right now, we would like to look older. Of course. But, um, <laughs> that's the ironic part. <laughs> but when you're older, I think, well, I would like to look my age because it's truthful. But, <laughs> um, but it's hard to just be that truthful when you want to try to look young and hip, I guess you could say. <laughs> so, yeah. It, I don't know, whatever I think in the future, because right now it's hard to tell. Yeah. What are you thinking, Chelsea? Um, same thing as them. <laughs> um, what I'd, would you do? I'd probably want to still look my age. And, well, I guess because, um, I guess I just, yeah, want to be <laughs> truthful. I mean, and, and then you kind of have your minds. When, well, when you're getting older, I guess your mind's not your mind. Your mind's not set yeah. on your beauty. Yeah, it's set on yeah. Your, um, education. It's more of your normal life. You wouldn't think about, oh, I'm I'm getting wrinkles. I should do a surgery like this. You're thinking about school and other people. Well, you guys friends. have a lot of good thoughts for older people. You don't think they're thinking about how old they look no. when they look in the mirror? No, I, don't, oh. I don't do that. Thank I goodness. think they do think yeah. how old they look <laughs> when they look in the mirror. <laughs> Only when you're really bored would you look at someone and go, I wonder how old they are. But that's my question because how do we treat, in our society today, how do we treat people who are well, first of all, let's start with very old, people in their 80s, et cetera, et cetera. She really loved her great-grandmother. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Why? She was very comforting, and she was very kind and sweet and caring. For but how was she her. different than her grandmother Lillian? <laughs> Everybody kept all calling Lillian. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't very. Well, I wouldn't say she's not very proverb because she probably is. She's just more comforting, like a normal grandmother, not this person who just keeps telling you what to do. Well, you You're can. In, Sorry, you can tell that because obviously she says she does, wants to be called Lillian when she's the grandma instead of grandmother because it sounds too old. old. And already you think that's not what a grandma should do. She's the grandma. She shouldn't <laughs> be called by the first name. Yeah. And so the great grandmother, Goldie, she just seems more like loose and not so uptight about things like you need to go here and here. And she just like more laid makes, back. makes um, Toby feel just warm all around. Very well paced. Like she's not Lillian. If you look at Lillian, she's way back in her past. She she looks like she's in her past, just thinking about things. She's mm. so she's acting so young when she's not. And then Goldie, on the other hand, the great grandmother, she's just moving along with time. She's just staying. She's accepting that she's old and she needs to be that way. So she's acting like a great grandmother. Well, what do you guys example. call your grandparents? Grandma, grandma, and grandpa, grandma, and then their name like oh, okay. Grandma Noel. Or okay, whatever. so they feel comfortable doing that. They don't yeah. ask you to call them yeah. by some weird other name. Oh no, no, no. because they're not like Lillian. <laughs> 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 well, describe Lillian because Lillian's quite a character. She's she's a, a dominating character. She thinks <laughs> she takes everything into her own hands. Like Toby's parents, hmm. she d Toby's parents just go with what she says, and she thinks. Toby should do this and that, and she just doesn't feel like a person who you could like have a nice conversation with or mm -hmm. just feel warm or good with. Because like Toby said in the book, all she does is listen when she's with her parents or her grandparents. 
or her grandmother, Lillian. She, all, mm -hmm. all they do is talk, and she, she, she can't, doesn't get a word in. She just listens until the very end. And I think she finds that very annoying because <laughs> she needs to talk. Yeah, I so. think so too. Nature plays a big part in this book. Yes. Um, and Orvis seems to be the one most attuned to it. Why do you think? Probably because all of his books, he was fascinated by the real animals, and he's always mm. just like so outside all the time. He loves to look at animals. He's just a different robot. Are you an, a nature person, Maddie? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like you like to get out and get your shoes dirty. No. I love nature. I'll just be around really. smelly cows. You do. No. Well, when, not the cow part. <laughs> When we were at outdoor school, mm -hmm. which was in the beginning of the year, we went out and it was just so fun going on hikes every day. It was mm -hmm. just good to see all the, the trees and we learned about all the plants. It was really fun. Nice. Yeah, it's good to do that, but I'm not like the person who just once in a while just says, let's go hiking and I'm just... I'm not someone who would live in the mountains. <laughs> Well, then it's a good thing we're inside the library. Yeah. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah. Well, I want to thank you guys. Uh, Chris Tremonti, Maddie Chrisman, and Chelsea Reza. You guys are great. Thank you very sure. much. Sure. Thank you. Good yeah. luck next year in middle okay, school. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. We also want to thank your teacher from this past year, Miss um, Rada Krinovich from Vista Elementary. Thank you so much for uh, mm -hmm. getting the kids all ready to go. Yeah. And our <laughs> special guest reader, Robert Picardo, we thank him. Next month, our book is called Getting Near to Baby. It's by Audrey Columbus. And get hold of it and read it. We'll talk about it next month. And if you want to come on the show, if you kind of want to come watch us tape the show, if you have any questions or comments or book suggestions, email us. It's Book Club of the Air. Just smush it together. Book Club of the Air at cs.com. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. So you like it? Yeah. Yeah. What would you change?